But what does cybersecurity mean for me? What's in it for me? What do I have to be thinking about? Um, and I just want to address just a handful of the issues that impact uh, individual users. Um, what's in it for you? It's about whether you can communicate privately with another person. It's about whether you can engage in financial transactions, you know, whether you'll be able to um, use your bank account online or whether um, you won't because the bank can't trust who you are and you can't trust that the bank is really your bank, you know, that the thing that looks like a bank is really your bank. Um, it's also about preserving this open, free internet that we have and that we've learned to value so much nowadays. You know, it, it didn't used to be the case that you could be sitting at your computer at home and get a view of the Great Wall of China live. I mean, it didn't used to be that you could do these things. We, we live in a, a really a wonderful world today that, that we're only beginning, I think, to appreciate and, and to understand what it would mean if some of it was taken away. And really, cybersecurity is about preserving these other values. And we have to keep that in mind, because as we think about what are the cybersecurity measures that ought to be taken, we don't want to compromise those other values. So for example, um, one value that's protected by security is free speech, right? You can, you can post anything, you can post it anywhere, um, and one reason you can do that is because security allows you to use the internet freely. So what are the threats to free speech that might come from security measures? Well, one that um, is a possible threat that we need to think about is, is really um, an effort to be able to find the bad guys. You know, you, you always want to find what human did something bad to another human, right? Uh, but on the other hand, the ability to speak anonymously on the internet is a, is a strong free speech value. It's been recognized by the Supreme Court, particularly in the political context. And just think about what, um, some people think, you know, anonymous speech is the downfall of the internet, right? It's because people don't have to be responsible for what they say. But on the other hand, it's also the way that um, um, some of the ideas that might sound radical at one point um, end up becoming um, influential in the marketplace of idea, things that would never um, be spoken if an, uh, anonymity wasn't um, protected. Um, where, where we come out on the uh, notion of authentication and anonymity, um, it seems that uh, a lot of what the government is doing is on the right track. This idea that as the um, interaction or transaction becomes of higher risk, then you can require more levels of authentication, more certainty that the person who is engaging in the transaction is who they purport to be. Um, another issue um, comes from um, government and industry collaboration. You know, in some ways, a lack of trust is a good thing. I mean, there was recently an inspector general report about the use of national security letters. It was abuse of national security letters. These are these form documents that the FBI can serve on, for example, your internet service provider to get information for an intelligence investigation. The IG found that um, the company representative was housed in the same office, in the same office space as the FBI guy. And instead of a national security letter, which kind of goes through an approval process within the FBI, they were exchanging post-it notes. Mm -hmm. Give me everything um, on this phone number. You know, I mean, so there's some benefit to an arm's length, I, guess, I should say civil liberties benefit, to an arm's length relationship between industry and government. Um, no doubt there needs to be more information sharing and more collaboration, um, but there have to be limits. Um, one extreme um, for government industry collaboration that I, I think we're not going toward would be that the government says, NSA says, look, we're the best. We do cyber better than anyone. We have the secret sauce, as one 
Homeland Security <laughs> official put it, uh, these uh, um, signatures that the bad guys use. Um, here, company, give us your communication stream. We'll clean it up, and then we'll send it on to you with all the bad stuff removed. What does that mean for private-to-private -private communications? Um, we think that there is a role for the NSA in, in helping companies secure these communications, and that role ought to be to share technology, to share these signatures, but not to uh, require or to even permit there to be uh, an ongoing sharing, mass sharing of private um, to private communications for a cybersecurity purpose. You know, we have um, a lot of surveillance statutes now that set the rules for when um, companies can share information with the government, um, share your communications with the government. And they say, for example, that if a company needs help protecting itself, if it sees a trespasser and it needs help, it can share communications. But the statute doesn't say that the company can share communications uh, content, for example, in order to help protect others. Well, I think that it might be necessary for there to be a very limited amendment to the surveillance laws to permit that kind of important sharing of information, but it needs to be carefully um, thought through, and I think it needs to be um, very limited. Uh, one more thought, and then I'll close, and that's uh, the need for transparency. Um, a lot of the cybersecurity efforts necessarily have to take place behind the scenes, um, but I think that openness is one key to a successful program. It builds public trust. It helps companies know what's happening to the information that they share and might make them um, more comfortable with the sharing of information.